All right, you're gonna make history. This is gonna revitalize your career, so look alive. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, your. Hey guys, before we get into the video, I just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a VPN provider which allows you to surf the web securely and privately. But the coolest thing about VPN providers and the reason I use VPNs is because it allows you to change your location so that you're not bound by your location's internet restrictions. And I know that sounds like really technical and boring, so I'll just give you an example. Let's say, for example, you're in the U.S. and you want to watch the current season of RuPaul's Drag Race. Well, in the U.S., Drag Race is only on MTV, but almost every else in the world, they watch it on WoW Presents Plus. Well, using a VPN service like Surfshark, you can just make a couple clicks, change your location to make it seem like you're in a different country, and now you're able to watch the newest season of Drag Race on WoW Presents Plus. And it's not just Drag Race, you can do the same thing for things like Netflix too. A lot of people don't know this, but streaming services typically have different catalogs for different countries. So if you wanna see what the Netflix looks like in a different country, or if you get that little pop-up on YouTube that this video is not available in your country, with just a couple clicks, you can change your country. It's literally just two clicks. I know there's a lot of VPN service providers out there, but Surfshark, unlike many others, don't track and sell your data. And they support a lot of your favorite creators, like me. So if you want to see what all the hype is about and try Surfshark for yourself, go to surfshark.deals/maddie or use promo code M-A-D-D-Y at checkout and get 83% off and three extra months free. You better surf that shark. And now, on to the video. Hi guys, welcome back to Give It To Me Straight. We're losing is not always the new winning. On the show today is a special guest, all the way from season nine. Nine. Season nine, Miss James Mansfield. Oh my God, hi everyone. Hi everyone over at like Maddie Morphosis' channel, Give It To Me Straight. This is Maddie Morph. yeah, Maddie Morphosis. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> That's fair. You forgot my name. I forgot what season you're on. I mean, my season was technically the new pilot from VH1, so mm. it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. We're the new season one. Before your season came out, you didn't even know you were going to be on VH1. You thought it was going to be another logo production. Yeah, I was fully prepared to like, get on there and think, well, only tens of people are going to see this, so no matter what, it's going to be fine. If I go home <laughs> first. It's totally fine. Yeah. It, it wasn't fine. Well, with that, though, do you think you would have behaved differently or done di anything differently had you known it was going to be on VH1? Oh no. I was a deer in the headlights then. I would be a deer in the headlights then again. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. matter. The, doesn't matter the medium. Doesn't matter the network. It didn't matter at all to me. Like VH1, maybe it would have like heightened it for me. I was like, oh my God, I'm on the same network as Rock of Love. Like that might have like really elevated it for me. Right. And you're like, because you're basically the Brett Michaels of drag. I mean, a little bit. Time. I do wear hats with hair in them. Mm -hmm. We all hide our headlines here. <laughs> Can you do me a favor real quick? Can you flip the, I think it's the middle light switch. Yeah, perfect. Getting a little toasty already. A little oscillating fan. Mm -hmm. It's like we're back in school. <laughs> I used to love budget. that with a fan go by and you're like. <gasps> <laughs> you know, I, I just like live my Beyonce fantasy. Just like feel the breeze, you know. And a wig that doesn't move. Well, you know, it's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is the plan is to learn how to move. <laughs> you know, I, I I live in my own world, my own fantasy world. It makes me happy. That's all that matters. That is truly what matters. You're happy. Yeah. We're all on a, just a floating rock flying through space, so nothing really matters. Flat rock. Flat rock. Oh, sorry. Flat rock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A stone, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get started, I just want to say you are a huge inspiration to me. As someone that was an early out, uh, you know, I was really worried that I was just going to go back to be in some small bedroom queen, but you showed that you can be a bedroom queen and be profitable. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. You know, I always love to hear when people say I inspire them. Mm -hmm. And then I get disappointed when I see the people that actually admit to me that I inspire them. I was like, oh, fuck. What am I doing? <laughs> you inspire me. I could have joined the military. Have you kept up with the newest season of Drag Race? Season 15? At the time of filming this, season 15 is the current season. Only because against my will. That's the only way they can get me to watch it because I host a viewing party here at the mm -hmm. art house. So I am actually really caught up. I know almost all of their names. Do you remember who Marsha is? Yes, times three. Yes, Marsha, Marsha Cubed. So do you think... <laughs> Do you think the critiques about Marsha's makeup are fair? As someone who didn't wear any makeup when they first came in the workroom, do you think the critiques of her makeup are fair? Or do you think they're being a little harsh? I mean, to be fair, I wore a lot of makeup on my season. I mean, I was practically, you know, a Van Gogh. I was a Van Gogh. But honestly, no. I think her makeup is fine. Mm -hmm. I think all drag is valid, and I think honestly, if she doesn't want to wear that many cosmetics, that's fine. Some girls don't have to muck up their face with a lot of cosmetics. 
<laughs> it's, oh. Wow. Take your pill, girl. Sorry. <laughs> this is the precedent where we're going in for this it's interview. Fine. We I'm just got very started. I'm intimidating. I get it. Uh huh. I just, you know, I've never seen a woman of your prowess before me before. I know. You look at me and you think, I know, Barbara Eden or Margot Robbie or somebody spring to mind. Lou Rawls. I don't know. <laughs> Hugo Weaving. Yes. <laughs> So as many as you probably know, James Mansfield, like June in the last episode, was also fresh eliminated on her season. What were your expectations going into the competition versus how it planned out? I prefer the term first place, but I mean, I came there fully thinking I was going to win. Mm -hmm. That's the delusion you need to have when you walk in the drag race. Mm -hmm. I came there with my four suitcases full of shit that I bought from Amazon and thought, you know what? I'm going to storm these girls. And it was like a light drizzle. It was a light drizzle. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's partly cloudy at best. Yeah. Like, what was the fan reaction like for you? Were you expecting the outpouring of love that you did get? Or did you really think that you were just going to fade into obscurity after your season? Honestly, the latter. Like, I left there thinking I left no impression whatsoever except for a really bad tumble pass. Mm -hmm. So, like, the fact that, like, people took to so many different things so quickly was really nice. And honestly, I left there thinking no matter what, even if I went home first, I was going to work hard to basically make sure I got to show the stuff I didn't get to show. That's why mm. the YouTube channel has been so helpful. Mm. It was my way of basically showing all the stuff I didn't get to show on this show, I could show here. So those that want to follow my journey will. And it's worked out. I'm very happy with where I am. Yeah. It's like you've curated like your own audience versus the general drag race audience. Yeah, because like honestly, I was a baby queen when I got on there. So I had all the nerve in the world thinking... I'm like nothing that's ever been on the show. I'm going to win. And then mm -hmm. when you have it smacked in your face, like you're not going to win. <laughs> you're like, I'm not like the other girls. It was very that. It was very humbling. And it just meant I had to learn and I had to grow more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've come a pretty far away. Like I was gorgeous then, but I'm like breathtaking now. But I think it's just the, it's the asthma. It's the asthma. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have asthma. Oh, it's me. You took my breath away. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's fine if you have asthma. Like, what's it like being inferior? We get more sympathy with that one. I love that. Mm -hmm. You always want sympathy. It's more important than anything. Yeah. As a first out, you know that better than anyone. Well, I never got sympathy. Honestly, it's been a hard road. Uphill both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. Through the snow barefoot. You got some, You had a whole uh, infomercial about you, about your journey. You got sympathy. You had Sarah McLaughlin and everything. Oh, that's right. You played a part in that. I did. A very small part. But you know what? I love a supporting <laughs> cast. Well, I mean, my, my part was on screen longer than you were, but that's beside the point. <laughs> We're splitting hairs here. We really are. Well, look, you know, some actresses have famously won Oscars for only being in 14 minutes of a film. So mm. it's okay. It's true. It's all about how they categorize it. Yeah. What'd you win for your time on the show? I got a tr expenses paid trip on Southwest. Ooh, so that was nice. They paid for my, they covered my luggage. <laughs> they never do that. Yeah. That's well, that's that VH1 money. There's, it's incredible how many direct flights to Milwaukee there were from Los Angeles. A lot of people are trying to get out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've heard from like multiple sources that people say that your audition tape was like the funniest one they saw. But when you got casted, it was actually about your fifth time auditioning. What mm -hmm. do you think went wrong with the first four audition tapes? That they were horrible. Mm -hmm. That was probably it. I wasn't really being myself. I was being what I thought they wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So like... On season nine, when I got cast, I just said, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to have fun with it and just talk out of my ass and say whatever I want. I barely answered questions. I never went into any of my backstory. It was just, I assholed off the whole time. And they loved it. They was just cutting jokes the entire time. Yeah. I completely just went overboard on the challenges where it's just like, here's what it is. And just had fun with the comedy challenges as well. It's just like I had a puppet and some of the stuff. It was mm -hmm. just being goofy. Mm -hmm. Speaking of your puppets, you do have like a strong love for puppets. I do. I'm, I'm sure you've talked about it in other interviews before, but indulge us if you will. How did you, what started your love of puppetry? And it's not just puppets, it's also like dolls in general, right? Yeah. Are those related <laughs> or just coincidental? It's just coincidental. I mean, like I ended up liking dolls more of a quarantine thing. I discovered that like, oh, I'm really gay. I want to collect small vintage things. Mm -hmm. I wish I hadn't because I'm like in the hole financially now because of it. Turns yeah. out vintage Barbie's expensive. But the puppetry thing was just something I fell into because I used to like make cloth dolls. So someone said, like, why don't you just make them talk? Do a puppet or something. When I was in high school, I was like, well, fine, I'll do it. And for a while there, I was doing like busking at Pride Fest with a puppet and everything. Very inspired by like Waylon Flowers and Madam. And after a while, I realized like, this is basically just my drag. And I wanted to do drag for a while. It's like, why don't I just do drag? 
I wish I had gone the other way because a puppet takes up way less space. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot easier to store a puppet rather than about 300 blonde wigs. Baby, if I could redo everything, I'd be the next Wayland Flowers. But here we are. Yeah, because I, I just came from your, I just came from your home and I have never seen so many blonde wigs in one place before. I felt like I was in like an Amazon warehouse section for blonde <laughs> wigs. You have, you have a lot of hair. If you, if you had to guesstimate, how many hairs do you own? Um, including my wig stock, I'd say probably about 400. 400. That's a lot of hair. That's a lot That's of blonde, a lot. too. Oh, and, they, and like one shade as well. <laughs> no shade. It is what it is. Team blonde. Yeah. I mean, I like to think that I'm the like resource to get the best blonde wig. Mm -hmm. If you want a blonde wig, I'm the girl to go to because I wear them all the time. Yeah. And I style for that dog, too, who only wears blonde hair. <laughs> D do you think she would be the same blonde bomb chef if it wasn't for you? Do you think... Oh, I, I'm, I'm phrasing you it. To, I'm, you I'm, want me to take credit for Trixie Mattel? I'm, 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 I'm phrasing, yeah, I'm phrasing that incorrectly. Do you think she would be where she is today without you? Yeah, I think her hair would be a lot uglier, but you mm -hmm. know what? She is where she is because she worked hard, mm -hmm. and I can respect that. And what I like most about her is, like, no matter what, she doesn't throw people away. Like, she's been friends with so many people for years, yeah. me, too, me included, that she wants all of her friends around her in all of her productions. Like, I was just in Trixie Motel helping her out. Mm -hmm. And she had friends working on that production that she had known for years. So, like, that's what I like about her. Yeah, she gives to charity. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> on the topic of Trixie Mattel, you guys both did drag in Milwaukee together. But talking about, like, your love of, like, dolls, is that also a coincidence? Or did you kind of fall in love with dolls after getting to know Trixie? Well, I always loved Barbies and stuff. Like, I always would have them. Mm -hmm. But, like, getting to know her, like, she also would just have, like, random thrift store Barbie dolls that she just had in boxes. Mm -hmm. Like, we bonded over that a little bit. But it wasn't until she got rich, rich, where I really got, like, whoa. She has closets full of just Barbie dolls. Mm -hmm. Like, she's out of her mind. I just yeah. have a few. That's what happens whenever unhinged people get money. It's just... <laughs> You know, as long as it's Barbie dolls, not just like little replicas of herself, it's mm. fine. It's fine. We don't have to call the, we don't have to call for the straight jackets yet. Yeah. No, she she went full unhinged. Like she got a little bit of money and she immediately started buying tens of thousand dollars worth of dolls and painted an entire motel pink. Just wild, wild. It's in Palm Springs. It's fine. Walls Four pink. out of five buildings there are pink. Yeah. I can't even paint my walls pink because I won't get my deposit back. But really? Different strokes, probably. But you nailed fur to the wall. Well. You might as well just have fun with it's, it. I don't have fur nailed to the wall. This is, the walls are just fur. Don't ruin the illusion. <laughs> Amy Sedaris once famously said about apartment, like renting, the best thing to do is just do whatever you want to the apartment because you'll never get to deposit back. So destroy the place. I'm going to rip up the floorboards before I leave here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Pacific Heights, they'll just destroy everything. Mm -hmm. A lot of drag queens' drag personas are just like heightened versions of themselves or even just people that are completely different from them entirely. What would you say the character of James Mansfield is for you? Um, she's a fun little outlet. Like, she makes me outgoing, honestly. Oh, I'm sounding so method right now. Like, inside the actor's studio at James Mansfield. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it was just an excuse. Like, I wanted to play a character. I think it's so boring just to talk in your regular voice. I don't know. I like to elevate it a little bit. Keeps people on their toes. Mm -hmm. It was really a hit when I first started in Milwaukee, and people looked at me like I was a psycho. Mm -hmm. Like, hi! They didn't yeah. like it. I was saying, I actually appreciate like your dedication to like the bit to the character because like Thank you. I'm someone like I don't have the I don't have the patience to like, put on a voice and do the whole song and dance, but like the vast majority of queens don't. No, I, I feel like where a lot of drag queens are drag queens. Yours is like more bordering on like female impersonation. A little bit of that I like to call it character comedy. That's mm -hmm. the term that they use for like a Dame Edna or Varla Jean Merman, Vendela mm -hmm. Creme. Even like you're portraying a character. Yeah, like you're not really you know a drag queen per se it's character comedy you're playing somebody mm -hmm. it's like you're not someone, you're not a drag queen you are james mansfield it's just like it's its own defined unique character yeah like there's a great comedian back in the 70s named flip wilson where he had flip and then sometimes he dressed up as geraldine and he completely committed to it had a put on voice and it was just the character he played in his repertoire mm -hmm. like there's a bunch of different characters i have it's just this is the only one I can't escape. Right. <laughs> You're too it far makes in the now. Money. <laughs> You're too far down the rabbit hole. Baby, it started to make money, so now we're here. I, I do say your drag, on top of being like to like being a character, it is very like big and exaggerated. What I imagine Texas drag would be rather than like Milwaukee drag. How did you set yourself apart like in Milwaukee? Well, in Milwaukee, honestly, it was a very big pageant town when I started. So like they expected like the full like beat, like the stamp face, and like you know the whatever you want mm -hmm. kind of lip syncing. I knew going into it, like, I can never be that. 
but I could probably be funny. And for the most part, I sometimes was. Mm -hmm. So I just got my niche in there. Luckily, there was only like three camp queens you can count on your hand. So mm -hmm. it really stood out. And I was very lucky. And also, a lot of the camp girls at that time were retiring. So for a while there, I was the only one. So it really helped. <laughs> it's okay when you're the only one. Mm -hmm. It's like how Nicki Minaj got really successful. She's the only one. It's like no one else is doing it. <laughs> no one else is doing it as good as you. So you might as well just say you're the queen. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to basic instinct the audience right now? Oh, no. I was just trying to get a little comfortable. Okay, just making sure. Bear in mind, I walked outside of my apartment like this and got seven-year itched immediately. Just like, mm -hmm. whoa! Yeah. <laughs> I know you touched on it a little bit before, but like as far as like starting drag, like why drag in particular? Like all the avenues of entertainment you were interested in, why was it drag that you like really pushed for? I feel like it kind of dealt into like a lot of my strengths that I already had. Like I knew how to sew. I kind of was dabbling in hairstyling from puppetry, and I always loved drag. Like I loved people like Varla, Hedda, Jackie B, and I thought like, well, I could do something like that. Where it's not so much lip syncing, it's more like live performance and talking and stand up. Like, that's what I wanted to do. So that's kind of how I dove into it. And the only downside was I was in Milwaukee where there was literally nothing going on like that. Right. No one was putting on plays. No one was doing anything. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It was fun. So I realized after a certain point when you're the only camp girl, you either have to get on Drag Race or bust. Mm -hmm. That's literally what we got. <laughs> Especially with drag being like as mainstream as it is. I'm really surprised there aren't more queens trying to do, or at least, you know, at least attempt camp and comedy. But as far as like doing it in Milwaukee, where it is a like big pageant scene, would you say like, you and Trixie were like oddballs? Like, what was it like starting drag out there for both of you? It was rough. I mean, you weren't taken seriously very often. People kind of booked you because they thought of you as the oddball that would just add variety to the show. It was like dance, 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 comedy, dance, 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 dance. So like, you were constantly fighting and bucking for that one comedy spot. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like where me and Trixie edged in a lot of the time. She got a lot more work than I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bear in mind, she was a lot better at drag than I was. <laughs> so yeah, once she left, it really opened up a lot of opportunity for me at mm -hmm. home. <laughs> it's, it's wild that like you lost so many opportunities to this. Not lost. I mean, it was justifiable. <laughs> no, you, she was really good. <laughs> I, I phrased that wrong. You were robbed of so many opportunities by this woman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not like I'm a victim. No, because yeah. like, again... I just worked a different scene from her. Like she got through more of the drag gigs. I did more burlesque. Mm. So that's really where it was. Would you say like her like style of drag and being in like close proximity and being friends, did that have an impact on your drag? Like taking inspiration from each other or did you kind of work independently? We worked independently. Like honestly, we were only really friends for like a full year. And like that was the same year she got on Drag Race. Mm. Cause I never really like worked a whole lot with her. Like, like once or twice, but like we just <laughs> got really close and then she went away forever mm -hmm. and we just stayed in touch. I honestly feel like she fostered the friendship more than I did because <laughs> she liked me a lot more than I liked her. So she, she sent more messages that were left on red than vice versa. <laughs> a little bit. I love her though because she'll tell you this firsthand. She'll only call you when she needs something. Mm -hmm. So if she needed a wig or a puppet or something, that's how you kept mm -hmm. in contact and we're in good graces. It's kind of like whenever moss grows on a tree, it's like mutually beneficial. I guess. Is moss beneficial? The trees, yeah. The thing. I didn't know. I'm not yeah. a botanist or whatever. Horticulture. Is that what you do? Like that. Is that what I do? No. Yeah. Was that what you did before you did all this? No, I was a custom. I just worked retail, but I was an FFA because whenever you're in a small town in Arkansas, that's the only thing that goes on field trips. So. What's an FFA? Future Farmers of America. Wow. Mm -hmm. No wonder yeah. you know so much about like moss and dirt. Yeah, and chickens. I know a lot about chickens. Really. Mm -hmm. Wow. More than anyone should. More than Miss Fame? Does she know a lot about chickens? Apparently that was like a fact they threw out in season seven. Oh, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I'll have to, we'll have to have like a quiz off about chickens. Ooh, I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would you say is the worst advice you ever got? And what was it like to receive it from Lady Gaga? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I love Stephanie. She's a colleague. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she has a lot of he's as two women in entertainment honestly you know she's my biggest competition uh -huh. like i can say this with a lot of respect that she's done good for herself mm -hmm. so i feel like she feels like she's at a good standing to give people advice but you know sometimes it's okay to temper and you know humble yourself a little bit mm -hmm. because i honestly feel like you know i've gotten pretty far without having to dumb down james mansfield yeah can you, i'm can dumb you, enough already can, can you explain to the audience exactly what the advice was that she got and why it backfired she said that she meant all the best with it she said i feel like you're hiding behind a character mm. 
And it would really help you out if you just stepped out of that character for once and just been yourself. And I did do that where I talked my regular voice on the runway and everything. And then I got sent home. So it wasn't good advice. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. I'm not being shady. It just wasn't good advice. Yeah. <laughs> Don't write a self-help book. Yeah. <laughs> you keep it to yourself. <laughs> Put it in the music girl. You're much more than a bedroom queen because on top of like doing like the YouTube videos and stuff, you're also like you own your own businesses. You're a wig stylist. You are an influencer, a drag historian, and like so much more. What is like the next big project or thing you want to aspire to? Oh, I would love to do like scripted content. Like anything that's like, you know. Like, like skits or television? Skits, television, anything. Like I would love to like stretch my creativity to beyond just drag race and like drag queen content mm -hmm. and start making stuff that like drag queens would actually act in whether it be for the stage or whatever. So more of like a producer writer role rather than an acting role? Yeah, but also like more of a vanity role too where I put myself into it as well. Because mm. I gotta be in it somehow. Right. That's how it works in Hollywood. You make yeah. your own vanity projects. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have ideas for those kind of skits or kind of like a rough outline of a show? I'm not gonna tell you a goddamn thing because a drag queen <laughs> should never tell another drag queen their ideas because they'll take it. Mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't say it like that. They'll steal it. Yeah. That's what they'll do. Like she stole your gigs back in Wisconsin. I didn't say that. We're paraphrasing, but it's, it was the implication. You are evil. <laughs> do you know that? That evil. is so rude to take words out of my mouth, misconstrue them, and make a narrative to suit your own content. You're, is this a drama channel? It's RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> this, is a, this is an attack <laughs> on my character and on that thing's character. I'm trying to find the line of like being shady without like crossing a line because at the same time You don't have I, to worry with me. I can take it. Well, it's not about you. It's just like, you know, her audience of 14 year olds is much stronger and much angrier than my audience of 14 year olds. So I got to be careful about the can of worms that we open up with this one. Oh, see, I don't fear them at all. I'm sure she's a lovely lady, but her audience is a ticking time bomb that we have to, it's a minefield. They already know how I feel about her. It's fine. <laughs> We've done so many crossovers at this point. They just know this is how our friendship is. Mm -hmm. I say one nice thing a year and then uh -huh. we, we continue on as yeah, usual. Yeah, you met your quota and it's time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from like the skit show and stuff like that, did you have like other ideas that you wanted to do, but just kind of floundered, stuff that didn't go as well as you thought it would? Other than Drag Race, of course. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like going in first place is a roaring success. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, other than that, like after I destroyed Drag Race and really demolished the competition, I'd say my, ugh, it's so hard to own up to your own mistakes, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm a big enough person to do so. Probably, you know, hmm. what's the question again? Is there anything that like, you attempted to do or wanted to do that you floundered or didn't pan out the way you hoped it would? Answering this question for one. But like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I'd say I had a residency in P-Town that didn't quite go the way I wanted it to. P-Town, elaborate. Well, like, I wanted so much for it and just like so much went wrong with it and I had no time to prepare it. And I wish if I could like start over again, I probably would have like nurtured it a lot more and put more into it. But it was right after season nine and it was just like ugh, no time to do anything, but I wanted the opportunity. So I blew that up. And I wish I could have done more with that. But yeah, that's about it. I mean, it's had a little run, but it wasn't as long as I wanted it to be. So with your show not going the way you hoped it would, have you ever thought about reviving it here in Las Vegas? I have. I mean, I had a successful run with it, like touring it. It just didn't work for that audience. Because mm -hmm. like it's a bunch of different beasts in P-Town. Like yeah. they expect a very level of like, how should I say it, production value and things like that. Like stuff I just wasn't prepared for to do mm -hmm. at that time. So, I mean... I definitely have been working on other stuff. I kind of stopped when quarantine happened. So like I'm slowly working back into doing the woman show stuff again because mm. I really, really enjoyed it. That's one of those things is like as far as it goes, performing whenever I did one woman shows, that was really where I was on the stage thinking like this is what I was supposed to be doing the whole time. Mm. Like that was the happiest I was. So I want to get back to that. We're slowly working on it. Yeah. I definitely feel like that's a niche too that's not being tapped into in Vegas. Um, cause a lot of like shows here, it's very much just kind of do a little song and dance for like, you know, the tourists and stuff like that. But yeah. like, as far as like comedy shows, one woman shows, things like that or pantomimes, you know, there's not a lot of that for like drag out here. I think it'd be really cool if you did something like that. It would be something different for Vegas. Cause then, again, like the most they really had was like impersonation shows. Mm -hmm. Like that was really the big thing here with drag for a while before drag race live. I don't really know much about Vegas's history to know if they had girls that really did like one. Oh no, Edie the entertainer. She's a girl that does stuff like that here. Mm -hmm. But it's like, again, one, 
We need yeah. more. What was it like whenever you did move to Vegas? Because obviously going from somewhere like Wisconsin to Vegas is probably like a culture shock. As someone from Arkansas, I can definitely say it's like moving into a pinball machine at times. But what was it like for you? What were your expectations going in and what shocked you? Nothing really shocked me. I mean, I visited before to see if I'd like it. And I got a little taste of it and thought, like, I could probably live here. But as far as it goes, it changed my life. Like, had I not moved here, I probably would have just plateaued and given up. And just settled on for the same, same old, same old in Wisconsin. Because mm -hmm. honestly, it's kind of, for lack of better words, people get comfortable there. Mm -hmm. And they get a tendency to never want to leave. And the day-to-day -day is just what they want. Where I knew if I wanted opportunities and I wanted to like grow more as an artist, I had to leave someplace bigger. And I couldn't afford LA, but Vegas is really, really close. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, so you didn't want to sit around and get stagnant and boring like all the other queens where you're from, is what you're saying. I'm not saying that. I'm paraphrasing, but that's... <laughs> we actually have a very diverse heard. and awesome drag scene in Milwaukee. There's a very, like, artsy scene. Mm -hmm. It's not so much pageantry anymore. It's kind of dying out. It's more like college drag. College drag. Elaborate. What do you mean by that? Or, like, the girls are, like, art students. Mm -hmm. And they have, like, these really great different takes on drag that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Yeah. It's way different now. So not not quite like Seattle artistic, but you know. Well, no one's eating on stage, but like, you yeah. know, it's really cool. You know, it's just out there. Mm -hmm. I feel like such a like boomer talking right now. Like, it's just hip, you know? It's got a good beat. You can dance to it. <laughs> Let me get up and do the Watu, see? Yeah. <laughs> we love a good mashed potato, you know? <laughs> I don't understand all of it, but I don't have to. Yeah. It's not for your generation. Why do you think I'm like 40? I just don't know. <laughs> I'm you're, like two years older than you. you. Well, you're very mature for your age, though. You know, it's just you, your energy is just more. You're an old soul. That's you're the one you dressed like Betty Davis right now. Uh, you, you look like a 50s housewife. The fuck? I'm blending genres right now, okay? This yeah. is modern vintage. I'm doing a character. <laughs> I did this for you. I try, I try to dress and compliment the guests in some way. I was like, okay, James Mansfield. This is what like you thought of the compliment housewife. Would be. It's my biggest blonde hair that I have at the moment. Again, you keep saying this is blonde. It's, why do you mean it's not blonde? <laughs> what is it? That it's brunette. This is not brunette. This is blonde. According to who? It's a dirty blonde. It's like a golden like blonde. It's not brown. It's not brunette. If a blonde is dirty blonde, that means it's a failure to achieve blonde. You only wear platinum. That's different. <laughs> your, your standards your standards have been so shifted because you've been staring at a wall of platinum blonde hair <laughs> for the past like 10 years and it's all you know now. I didn't realize I was sitting like the Raquel Welch. Okay, I'm glad you enjoy your burnt toffee colored blonde wig. I invite you into my home and you insult me. I've been nothing but I thought kind, that's what you invited me here congenial. for. No, I bring you here so I can insult you because the audience oh, likes well, that. It's good, for my, for, it's good it. for my TikTok algorithm. <laughs> well, guess what, Mimi? <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, as, as I said earlier, despite your like short time on the show, you did get, garner like a really like passionate and good fan base. Good fan base? That's a bad word. How do I want to word this? Just think of a lie quick, like the Grinch. <laughs> so like the Grinch? Yeah. He thought up a lie and thought it up quick when he's talking to Cindy Lou Who. Was that in the movie or the book? That was the cartoon. Oh, the cartoon one. See, different generations. I watched the live action one. Oh, you poor soul. No wonder your comedy's the way it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no wonder you're stuck in the past. What do you mean? <laughs> the cartoon one was made like the 70s, wasn't it? So despite being on the show only for like one episode, you did cultivate like a very like, big following, I would say. Especially yeah. given the circumstances. And you have a very passionate fan base online. And you even managed to make some guest appearances back on the show. Would you ever go back for like an All-Stars? Absolutely not. No? I would never go back to All-Stars. I don't believe in parading myself in a cheap extension of my career just to boost myself up for a following. Ugh, I could never. I honestly think you would do well in something like that, but I understand your mindset. I, you, know, you shouldn't sell it like that. You have to have a stance about something, you know? And this is where I take my stand in these... Four inch mule heels. <laughs> I stand digging them into the ground right now. Four inches. Yeah. You rounding up? Bitch, this is. Hold on a second. This is four inches. <laughs> it is. I'm just being shady. You, <laughs> you cow. <laughs> I was like, of all the things I said tonight, the one you got the most defensive about is when I, I, I said your shoes weren't four inches. <laughs> you broke character and took your shoes. <laughs> Look here. Again, it's about life is about taking stances on something. You gotta take a stand, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, put you gotta put your three inch heel down, <laughs> three inch biscuit heel down. So we're now gonna move on to a segment called "Are You Smarter Than a First Out?" I'm gonna read you some drag trivia. Okay. And uh, if you know the answer, amazing. And if not, then we'll learn together. Fabulous. 
So your, your season was the first season on VH1, but it's not the first time RuPaul had a show on VH1. What was the first one? The RuPaul Show, mm -hmm. with Michelle Visage as the co-host, and where she famously rewears a lot of her dresses from the current seasons. Yeah. <laughs> Drag her. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, like, I was like, I've seen that before. I bet you there's a new panel in that. <laughs> It's just a lot more safety pins in the bag. More chip <laughs> clips, for sure, for sure. Who is the queen who is credited for starting the house system in ball culture? Crystal LaBeja. Yeah, Crystal LaBeja. She started the house of LaBeja and one of the first balls for black queens due to perceived racism within the drag pageantry system. Oh, it wasn't perceived. It was full-on racism. She was known for painting herself lighter to be passable. Like, that's what's expected of black queens to compete in mostly white balls. Roughly, when did the term drag originate? That one I do not know the, to like the concise answer to, but I also would argue no one actually does. No one knows the exact time, but one of the first instances of it being recorded, what a lot of people think is the oldest recorded usage of the word, it was in 1870. Really? Yeah, it was in a UK Reynolds newspaper for an event which people said, we shall come in drag, which means men dressed in women's costumes. Lovely. UK newspaper. They better work. The Polari set, yes. Mm -hmm. Contrary to what some people may think online, I am actually not the first straight drag queen. What is the name of the prominent straight queen from Australia whose career extended from 1955 up until at least 2019? That would be Barry Humphreys, also known as Dame Edna, who also had other characters like Les Patterson, but also not the really, I don't know, there's been tons of straight drag queens mm -hmm. like Julian Eltinge, who actually starred in movies in Hollywood. Flip Wilson, Milton Berle, Bugs Bunny. I mean, it's honestly been a, a career that many straight men have had more success than actual gay men doing for a right. while. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of the counterculture queen between the 60s and 80s who was also the muse of filmmaker John Waters? Oh, Divine. And um, his original muse was Malcolm Soul. Malcolm Soul. A beatnik chick that wore bright blue eyeliner and he loved her, but she died really early in her life. You hit me with another fact that I didn't even know about. Uh, Divine, she started movies such as Pink Flamingos and Hairspray, and she's actually the inspiration behind Ursula's appearance in The Little Mermaid. Yes. Not to mention, like, she had an amazing career in Europe as a dance artist. Like, she stomped the grounds, yeah. honey. She had a lot of, like, chart-topping hits, like, especially, like, around the world internationally. Oh, yeah, like, they never got her here, but she was a superstar elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Who was the self-identified drag queen who became one of the faces of the Stonewall Riots and was one of the founders of the Gay Liberation Front? Um, depends. There were two, both trans women and drag queens. Is it either Marsha P. Johnson or Sylvia Rivera? Uh, Marsha P. Johnson is the one I was referring to. Okay. Yeah, Sylvia Rivera was definitely one of the bigger names, but I think a lot of people, when they think of Stonewall, they imagine Marsha P. Johnson, who a lot of people think threw the first brick, but has herself denied that claim. Yeah. Because she says that she wasn't there, she showed up the next day, but... She definitely became a staple like, of the movement and one of the loudest voices in it. Oh, yeah. like Again, like Stonewall, it's one of those fun things where it's almost mythology at this point. Like, yeah. how many stories are out there? Mm -hmm. But it is, it I was love it. Fighting for gay rights, people were killed. <laughs> Nobody was killed. No one was killed. <laughs> people were yeah. arrested. People did get their asses kicked. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, especially people like in my generation and younger, a lot of people think that like Stonewall, like riots and Pride Month was started because... It was about like, marriage equality. It wasn't about that. It was like police brutality. Oh, no. Marriage equality was actually kind of like a conservative gay issue. Mm -hmm. It was more about, can we not get our asses kicked and actually, you know, our space enjoy ourselves? And, yeah. So we don't have time for the whole segment, but the whole like history behind like gay clubs, speakeasies, and the mafia is such like a wild story to think about now. Oh, yeah. It's so, it's wild. It sounds like make-believe. It's so crazy. Like even that, like going deeper into like the ball circuit and like how drag balls were underground it's very relevant today because it might actually get back to that soon <laughs> yeah and so history does seem to repeat itself unfortunately <sighs> who was widely considered to be the first drag queen in america um it would be william dorsey swan yep yes yeah william dorsey swan who was a former slave who led the very first that we know of queer resistance movement in the u.s uh, she referred to herself as a queen of drag as early as the 1880s. Yes, and um, there's another fact, but I wish I could remember their name, but it was actually a black drag queen in the 20s who was one of the first to play live jazz music on a record. Which national pageant system was forced to change its name in the mid-90s due to legal threats from none other than Donald Trump? That would be Miss Gay America? No, close. Miss Gay U.S. of A. That's it. Yeah, formerly called Miss Gay U.S.A., 
because Trump owned the right to Miss USA. He made them change the name because he didn't want his system being associated with, you know, gay and drag pageantry. And that would appear with what's his nuts and drag later on in a video. Oh, Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The irony. Ugh. It's thick. It's thick. <laughs> Yeah, and it wasn't the first time either. He actually like tried to shut down other pageants as well because they were. He also owned the Miss Universe pageant, and several smaller systems had Miss Gay Universe type names. And he's every one of them he could find sued them and blew them out of existence. But Miss Gay US of A is still around today. Interesting to see what he was spending his money on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> shutting down drag pageants. This and is paying, where your priorities were. Paying porn stars, but you know. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have, and the last of my cards. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode. James, where can the people find you? You can always find me at YouTube at James Mansfield. And I am also on Instagram, sometimes on Twitter, and TikTok at James Mansfield. Mm -hmm. What's your alt? You're on Twitter. What's your alt? Oh, I'm not telling you. <sighs> you don't get to see Ooh. what my perverse taste in porn is. Because you are a good Christian woman. Well, not Christian. I'm just, you know, a woman. You are a good atheist woman. <laughs> I'll take that. A good satanic woman. Wow. I really like labels, but you know, I kind of swing wherever my heart goes. You know, the heart wants what the heart wants, I guess. <laughs> and we don't know what it wants because she won't tell us the alt. But anyway, thank you all so much for tuning in. Join us next time whenever we have somebody else. And yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs>